Today on Applied Science, I'm going to show you how I repaired this giant industrial x-ray sensor and then used it to make time-lapse and stop-motion animations. I always strive to show something unique in each of my videos, and in this case, I guarantee you haven't seen anything quite like this. This is a cut stem from an apple tree that is, you can see, drawing fluid up from the beaker and distributing it out through its leaves. This is so cool, the fluid in the beaker is potassium iodide, which absorbs x-rays more than the rest of the water in the plant's tissue. So you can actually see the water movement throughout the plant. You can even see the annular structure of the stem. So the core of the stem is just structural, the fluid movement is actually toward the edges of the stem. I tried this with some other plants too, in fact I thought that having the root ball uh, of the plants would change the way it draws up liquid, so instead of a cut stem, this is a whole potted plant down in the beaker of potassium iodide. Interestingly, it actually didn't draw the fluid up nearly as much as the cut stem. And then I tried this again with a piece of lime tree, also a cut stem, and you can definitely see fluid movement up the stem, but not as much as the apple tree. So then I decided to try something else, something mechanical that moves over time. Of course, the obvious uh, idea there is a clock, and so I took a quartz clock, an analog quartz clock, and uh, did this time lapse. And I also really liked the overlapping gears. It's really kind of a neat look at something that you normally wouldn't see. And you can see that my triggering mechanism is very consistent in its time. The second hand is not moving. You can also see the length of the exposure is about five seconds. And you can see that the second hand doesn't move continuously. It moves in discrete steps. So you can kind of figure out a lot about what happened with the object just from looking at it in x-ray. And then finally, uh, this is a stop-motion animation of a camera zoom lens, and I used a stepper motor to very slightly move the zoom position between each shot, and this was maybe a two or three hundred frame sequence. Pretty cool. In today's video, I'm going to show you the behind the scenes, the image acquisition and sequencing, the x-ray source and safety regarding that, uh, and then we'll do a teardown of this panel at the end. Uh, but first, everyone say, thank you, Amir. Amir is the gentleman that sent me this panel, without which none of this would be possible. These things are extraordinarily expensive and difficult to find. And when we tear it down, you'll see why. It's basically a gigantic camera sensor in there. Whereas a, in a camera like this, the sensor is on the order of one or two centimeters squared. This is a 40 by 40 centimeter camera sensor, an eight megapixel sensor, a four megapixel sensor but the area is absolutely enormous so that it's very sensitive to light. The bigger the sensors, the bigger the pixels, the, the more sensitive they are to incoming photons. And those photons come from a fluorescent screen that's also inside there. So when we get a shadow gram, when the x-rays come in and hit this, it actually produces light inside there when it hits the phosphor screen, and then the camera sensor is bonded right to that phosphor screen, so it's super sensitive. Another way you could build this is just to have a fluorescent screen and then a camera lens far away looking at the screen. But that wouldn't give you anywhere near the same amount of sensitivity just due to the area. Here's the whole setup. We've got the x-ray tube here, the object and the sensor. I use the computer to sequence this whole thing, turn on the x-rays, start an image acquisition at the panel. About five seconds later, the image is acquired shut off the x-rays, and then wait a minute or two for the next frame. And most of those sequences that you saw were two or three hundred frames long, so that they would run for five or ten seconds at 30 to 60 frames uh, playback speed. So let's talk about safety a little bit. This x-ray tube is a 50 kilovolt, one milliamp model, which is very comparable to a dental x-ray. So imagine a lot of the same safety considerations and provisions that a dentist takes when using a dental x-ray would apply here. The beam size is about the same, the uh, voltage is about the same, and so is the current. So as you can see, we want to stop the primary beam. It helps a lot to think about x-rays like the beam of a flashlight like this, where the, the intensity of the beam is quite high in the primary beam, of course, and so we want to stop that. And as you can see, I've got a bunch of steel back there to stop the primary beam. But as you know, if you're in a dark room and you shine the flashlight at a wall, there's quite a lot of backscatter that comes off of this. And so this is the whole reason that you want to do x-ray in an enclosure, to shield yourself from all that backscatter. In fact, the backscatter can be intense enough where you can use it to make a whole imaging system. And this is how backscatter imaging was done at airports for uh, years before they ripped them all out. In fact, I have a video on that too, uh, building a, an x-ray backscatter imaging detector. 
In this case, the enclosure is my shop. I went around the outside of the building with a Geiger counter and very carefully measured background levels, even with the door open. Now, it is true that when I'm setting up one of these shots, I'm inside and exposed to some amount of the backscatter. But knowing how sensitive this Geiger counter is, I can tell you that the total dose is much less than a cross-country flight. If you really want to see something, look for a video about uh, showing a Geiger counter on an airplane at altitude. You might be surprised that it's five to ten times higher than background, and you're exposed to it for hours and hours. And so the total dose that you get from one airplane ride is much, much higher than the dose that I got from this small amount of backscatter in the shop. Here's a look at an x-ray tube. This is a very simple, just a three terminal device. And what we do is put a high voltage across the tube so that there's maybe 50,000 volts between this terminal and this terminal. And nothing happens yet because there's no electrons to be accelerated. So the next thing we have to do is put a low voltage across these two terminals from the wire to here. And what that does is heat up a filament inside here and the filament boils off electrons which are accelerated by this high voltage. And when they slam into the target here, x-rays are produced. So the thing to know is that inside that little cup where the filament is, there's some carefully controlled geometry to focus the electron beam down to a very tight spot. The smaller the spot size, the better the resolution. Here's the power supply stack for the x-ray system. We've got a 27 volt supply feeding into the high voltage power supply. And that's controllable with this knob over here. It reads off in uh, tens of kV. And this system operates almost independently. So remember I said you can turn the voltage up on an x-ray tube and nothing happens right away. You can keep that voltage on all the time, in fact, and uh, that's okay. So the other system drives the filament in that x-ray tube and it's in a servo loop. So what you can do is set a desired emission current from zero to one milliamp and then the power supply increases the filament temperature by giving it more and more current until that emission current is achieved. So it's actually a, a nice control loop and you can dial any amount of current you want independent even of the voltage uh, within the tubes, you know, operating parameters. This is kind of funny too, you know, it looks like these high voltage connections are shielded. Remember, because if you've got 50,000 volts in a wire, uh, it's going to, you know, charge up things nearby and, and draw dust to it and create all kinds of problems within the field. So it's actually a coax, but this is no ordinary PL259. In fact, <laughs> whoa, 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 it's a very strange looking uh, connector there. Um, obviously meant to just keep down arcing and stuff, although this one seems a little excessively long. I thought you'd get a kick out of that. I added a remote control voltage to this little box too, so that it can be locally controlled where the knobs directly control the voltage and current. Or when it's in remote, you can set a desired current, and then the x-rays will only be on when these two wires have a three volt signal applied. So it's kind of an inherently safe system where if it's remote controlled and there's you know, no voltage here at all, then there's no x-rays coming out. That three volt x-ray turn-on signal is supplied by this Teensy microcontroller, uh, which we're controlling from the same computer that does the image acquisition. And then the Teensy is also sending a step and direction command to this um, Linny stepper, which is a stepper motor driver. And the stepper motor driver controls a stepper motor, surprisingly, that's connected to whatever we want to do a stop motion animation. So in this case, it was the camera lens, the zoom camera lens. So this way I could uh, do the x-ray on off acquisition, move the stepper motor, wait a minute, do another um, actuation and, and get the whole sequence that way. The software that interfaces with the digital x-ray sensor is um, a surprisingly difficult to use. It's a, kind of buggy and it's not extensible and it's kind of quirky in how it works. Uh, you might even say it's enterprise grade. But one of the quirks is that you can't really get images out of it programmatically. So the only way I could think of to automate it is to use a mouse control program and just record the mouse movements that I would use with the normal UI to get an image saved. Um, this actually worked pretty well. It's a little hokey, but, but it did work. And I found out that if you don't close the windows in the right sequence, the program will crash after it runs for you know eight hours or something, 100% every time. And so, and you can't just like click the red X, like it had to be right click and then close. And it, figuring this all out took uh, literally weeks because you'd have to wait for a day to find out it failed and then start over again. 
But, you know, covering all this stuff is just not that interesting for a YouTube video. But there was a lot of details in sort of working out the bugs and the constant crashing and the image failures and everything. But anyway, um, the firmware that's running on the Teensy microcontroller basically listens for serial commands to turn the X-ray on and off and to move the stepper motor. And it enforces its own X-ray timeout, too. So if it gets the X-ray on signal, it's always going to shut off 20 seconds later even if it doesn't get the x-ray off signal, basically. Um, it also, uh, if there's a power failure or something, it's also inherently safe. It never gets the x-ray on signal. So it's, it's very limited in how it can um, turn on the x-ray. And I, I wanted to make sure it was going to be inherently safe for a lot of different circumstances. The images are not saved in any normal format. Um, in this proprietary software, if you want to, you know, save an image, for example, you have to right click and say, um, save image as for every single image. <laughs> and so there's no batch export. They aren't stored on the drive in any obvious format that you can get or anything. So I had to start digging around and I looked through all of the files based on modified date. And lucky, luckily, they are stored in a raw format. They're just buried in like a non-human readable location. And um, when they say raw, they really mean raw. It's just the first two byte word of the file is that pixel's value. And then the next one is the next pixel's value and so on. It's really raw, which is good because I can open it in octave. And uh, I wrote a little script to basically read that image. You read all the images in in this weird um, directory location rename them and save them as TIFFs along with some um, image flipping. But I do get to save 16-bit TIFFs, which is pretty nice. So I get really high dynamic range. The sensor itself is a 14-bit sensor. So it's nice to get uh, to preserve that extra high dynamic range. After exporting these two or 300 TIFF files, I just import them right into Resolve, the nonlinear editing software that I use. And uh, it's amazingly good. I, the import pulls them in as a video clip and I can even edit them, you know, directly 16-bit everything just all worked out great. Powering the panel for many hours also proved to be a challenge. If you just put voltage on the panel's um, input terminals that are meant to interface with this battery, it doesn't boot. It needs communication either with a battery or with some kind of special power adapter that I don't have. And it's possible that that communication is as simple as a pull-down or a pull-up resistor or something, but I never found it. And so what I ended up doing was kind of front-running the battery. So I took an old dead battery, although it's still, um, it's just the capacity is, is really bad, but I mean, it does work. And I wired terminals to the output terminals and supplied that with 12 volts from this supply. So now I can slide this whole thing in the panel and it will power up and it will run indefinitely off the power from the supply, but the battery is still doing communication to get the thing working. And I found out that, you know, the, the fuel gauge will decrement all the way down to 0%, but it keeps running. And it will even turn on at 0% and keep running. And so this was a pretty good sneaky solution to um, get the panel to run indefinitely off, you know, external power. Let's take a look inside the x-ray detector. This is kind of a fun thing to tear down because it's so unlike consumer electronics. No expense is spared in here. We have very expensive components, hermetically sealed ceramic packages. It's even got these really cool shock mounts to mount this whole thing inside the carbon fiber case. Then it has a carbon fiber stiffener uh, x-ray absorber between the circuit board and the actual detector. Uh, but let's just start going through some of these components here. Maybe one of the easiest circuit boards is over here. This whole thing is just for the Wi-Fi. So it's actually got a little uh, gray coax that goes to the antenna over here. And then it's got a shielded on both sides uh, ribbon cable or flex that goes to the main board and talks to the FPGA. But this whole thing is just a self-contained little Wi-Fi board. Uh, speaking of the FPGA, it's the Cyclone 3 that drives this whole thing. I think there may be a couple other small microcontrollers on the main board uh, to control bring up and things like that. But I don't see any other huge processor. There's no like DSP or any big looking processor. This other large uh, pin count chip is an ethernet interface. So there's some sort of a differential data link between the FPGA and this ethernet phi interface. And then there's an ethernet switch, which selects which one of these two ports uh, is gonna be connected to the phi. So this thing actually has two ethernet interfaces. One of them, is a 100 megabit link 
and it uh, goes through here. You can see up here the twisted pairs, two twisted pairs go this way, and four twisted pairs go this way, and four of the pairs go to this uh, isolation transformer, and the other two pairs go to this isolation transformer. So from this point on, there's basically two parallel Ethernet paths, but the machine can only use one at a time because this switch is actually, uh, you know, it's a one of two selector. The Ethernet interface that goes toward the bottom of the unit is in theory a gigabit connection because it's got four pairs, but I've never gotten it to work and it's not documented anywhere in any of the manuals or product specifications that I can find. And since this thing has control over its own switch here, the link isn't even connected until the machine decides it wants to. So it could be some kind of a factory mode. Um, this, this connector on the bottom here goes to a, a set of rigid pins that's, that go through the case. Presumably you could slide this whole thing into like a docking station or a charging station. But again, none of this is specified in the documentation or any of the sales literature or anything. Uh, the link that goes this way, the 100 megabit link, is uh, pinned out. It actually does go to this connector here. And as you can see, this is the battery connector. And normally the battery just connects up with those bladed terminals. And it's got a plus and a minus, of course. And then it's got a data connection and a temperature sensor connection. But then it's also got all of these other things, this kind of weird, uh, unusual looking plug here. This is for uh, powering the unit from an AC adapter. And then conveniently, you also get an ethernet port. So while I was fiddling with this thing, before I actually got the ethernet, or before I got the wireless working, I soldered on an ethernet cable, and this didn't work actually. I don't know why this, there, there's more to it. I think you actually have to pull a pin low for this thing to realize that you're gonna use the ethernet link, and it just doesn't bother to power up the ethernet otherwise. And anyway, in the meantime, I got the wireless working, and then I, I didn't really need the hard wire anymore. But for whatever it's worth, uh, I never got this hard wire um, ethernet link to work. This small PCB here has three relays, which are actually powered by the plug itself, the external plug. So what this does is disconnect all the power connections galvanically. Like it's not just a MOSFET switch. When the relay is open, there's really just no connection at all. And that means that there's no power exposed to the pins on the bottom unless those relays are closed. And the only way the relays get closed is powering them from the plug. So it's a way of ensuring that there would be no way to short out the circuit or put in too much voltage unless you're already applying the correct voltage to the pins here. It's kind of an interesting thing. Like I say, this, this whole unit is just engineered to an extremely high degree. Everything from the expensive packages to the you know, very careful selection of hardware and everything, it, just no expense spared. This whole system requires quite a few different voltages and all of these connections are supplying different rails from the power board up here. There's also an RS-45 connection that goes from the main board back to the power board uh, to talk to the microcontroller up here to you know, find out if the voltages are okay or how much power is being used, that sort of thing. I never found a real killer analog digital converter. It's true there's a couple of small ones here. This is a DAC and this is an ADC. Both nice parts, but I have a feeling these are probably just for measuring and setting reference levels or something. I think it's possible that uh, some of the analog digital conversion is being done in the panel itself, although I really don't know. There's a ton of connections, as you can see, and these are super expensive looking interconnects. Again, no expense spared uh, to connect up all the 2048 by 2048 pixels uh, into the main board. This whole thing doesn't have much for a UI. It made the bring up and sort of figuring out how to use this before I had the software very, very difficult. It just has one power button and four LEDs, the battery connection, and then that mystery connector at the bottom, and that's it. There's no other switches or knobs or feedback or anything to figure out. And so when I first got this, it was broken, but it would actually power up. You could put a battery in and you'd get like a bad sequence of LEDs. And by bad, I mean like a red flashing LED. So originally I started trying to get in through the RS-485 interface and wasn't having a huge amount of luck there. And then I was trying the ethernet interface and again, nothing was powered up. Like I just couldn't find anything. So eventually I worked my way down to the power board thinking that you know, none of the voltages were really powered up or it didn't seem like, you know, some of them were powered up but some of the rails that were, should have been there seemed like they weren't. So I started focusing a bit more on the power board and this is actually where I found the problem. So let's turn this over. 
and you can see how I fixed this. It turned out to be a relatively simple problem, but sometimes finding these simple problems is not trivial. What happened is that something fairly pointy was pushed into the panel, or the panel was dropped onto something pointy. And I know it was pointy because what happened is the the trauma was sort of focused onto this light guide. So there's this lucite, you know, or acrylic light guide that connects up the LEDs on the board to the little, you know, indicator, uh, you know, light guides on the outside of the case. And when it experienced this trauma, the little light guide acted like a ramrod and actually pushed one of the chips off the board, almost off. It bent the pins and maybe shorted a couple out and pushed the uh, package mostly off the circuit board. So after I had taken it down to this degree, I, I could actually see it was broken. So that was kind of a lucky fix, but it didn't occur to me to look at the bottom of the board right away because it seemed like we had power up. In any case, luckily the part was a relatively standard MOSFET and lucky me with the chip shortage, it was actually available and I got it from DigiKey and put the new chip on and everything works now. And then now that I have the software going, uh, it's a fully functional unit as far as I can tell. Well, I hope you found that interesting. See you next time. Bye.